as some of you may know, uh, Simon is the director of Acacia, and we're delighted to have you with us. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Terry, and I'm uh, delighted to be here as well. I've had connections with Church and Peace in a number of contexts over the years. I remember a very stimulating and challenging day that we had um, with uh, the Mennonites as well, uh, looking at responsibility to protect, for example. And there are quite a few familiar faces in the room, so let me say, good to see you, and sorry I haven't answered your email yet. Um, <laughs> and um, just to say a little bit about myself, uh, Terry said I'm director of Ecclesia, uh, which some of you may know. It's... Um, I think a non-conformist Christian think tank would be a good way of putting it. We're really doing two things. One is exploring uh, what Christianity is and what it might become um, post-imperial religion and post-big big religion, big economics and big politics. You know, what, what are the prospects for uh, a kind of Christianity which recovers some of its dissenting traditions from the past, going right back to the early church through Anabaptism and all kinds of other dissenting movements within the church. And then on the other hand, we're very much engaged in social justice issues, peacemaking, uh, welfare and disability from the point of view of how is it that our beliefs and values shape the stance we take in public life and enable us to say and do something different, to hold out for something different in a, a very pressed consumer kind of society. So that's what Ecclesia is about. And just about me, um, I live in Scotland, I live in Edinburgh, or more specifically I live in Leith, which is part of Edinburgh or near Edinburgh, depending on your point of view. <laughs> and um, I have to make a, an apology that I normally have a rule that whenever I'm involved in a meeting like this I stay right to the end, and that was my intention. But then I discovered that actually the launch of a book that comes out today that I've edited called Scotland 2021 takes place tonight in Edinburgh, so I'm going to have to nip off at lunchtime, and I am sorry about that. But you have had the first plug for the book, so that's good. Um, and then the other thing to say is, and it's for me an important part of my story, is that I'm honoured to have become, uh, during the past year, a member of the Iona community as well. So that very much shapes my kind of perspective and engagement with these issues. So the only other apology that possibly needs to be made is that because my system is a bit different to the one this was imported to, interestingly the logo has kind of come down into rethinking security. That might be significant in its own right. If some of you will recognise the logo, it was one used by the London Mennonite Centre for a number of years. It was actually done by a friend of mine called Priscilla Trenchard, um, who did it as a piece of artwork and it got turned into uh, a logo. And of course it incorporates... A cross? Is it a cross turning into a dove or a dove turning into a cross? It's a, it's a very interesting little uh, image for us to start with. Okay, so let me say a little bit about the journey I want to, to take you on. Uh, looking round the room, there are quite a number of people with considerable more, uh, considerably more expertise on issues of security the, than I am. So I'm not trying to pretend to expertise, but I've tried to, to, to approach the issue of security afresh, really. And I want to, to run through, the, to make a few points about the, the, the following uh, uh, topics. First of all, to say a little bit about security between the local and the global, which is where we find ourselves. Then to look at what, for me, are five foundational dimensions of what we call security. Um, a, a kind of little aside about the, the paradoxical psychology of the whole thing. Um, and then I'm going to end by suggesting that, rightly understood, Christianity is actually a recipe for insecurity, or at least for undermining the kinds of securities that uh, entrap, imprison, and enslave, and indeed threaten us. So there's the question of false security as well as the kind of, of security that can really make us secure, if you like. And then uh, I want to say something about rediscovering morality beyond those kinds of notions of security. So I was asked to start with, with uh, morality and theology. I'm not going to go into a big explanation as to what those might mean, but rather to explore them in practical uh, ways. OK, security between the local and the global. Shall we start with a text? That was actually the question I asked myself, because I have to say, these days, though it's changed over the years, when I come to do a presentation, 
if I know I'm supposed to be going on for 40 minutes, which I am, I would have, you know, 4,000 words so that everything would be in its place and I would know exactly what I was going to say and there wouldn't be any flubs or mistakes and so on. And I thought, well, if I'm doing something about security, I think that's actually a bad idea. <laughs> so the challenge of the situation is that though I have these headlines and though I've rehearsed some thoughts in my head, neither you nor I know exactly what I'm going to say. And I think that's probably a good thing. Another sense of shall we start with the text has already been decided because you chose a text and we've started with the text. In our different traditions, uh, and, and that would apply to all of us from our different backgrounds uh, here, there are going to be texts and ideas and foundations that we, in a sense, don't get a choice to start with. And actually, when we were preparing for this, um, Terry very graciously asked me if uh, she should go on and read verse 6 of Micah which talks, as you remember, about smiting the Assyrians. We could have ended on a nice note of peace, but actually there's more to the text than that. Um, and I'll come back to that in, in just a moment. But um, the text I decided to start with in preparing was I thought I would go on to the wonder of the internet and find out what happened when I put the word security or global security into Google, other search engines are available and see what they did with it in terms of their algorithms, which are, of course, uh, designed to achieve certain kinds of commercial and other purposes. And I suppose, probably like you, when the word security is said to me because of my engagement in, in peace issues and so on, I think of nuclear weapons and weapons of mass destruction and responsibility to protect, which we've already talked about, and international relations and a whole lot of things in that kind of area. But actually, if you go onto most search engines and you put security or even global security in, what you'll get is cyber threat, burglary and terrorism as the three things that, that, that uh, come up. And by burglary, I mean, you know, the kind of burglar alarms that you can put on your house. And that's very interesting. Uh, that would have shifted considerably in the last 20 years. But that's where an awful lot of people start when thinking about these kinds of issues. So that's the e-text. Let's now just turn for a moment to Micah and what I've called the Ur-text and Our-text. Ur-text is, if any of you are biblical scholars, you'll know much more about this than me, but it's kind of what stands behind the text. Often, particularly with the Hebrew scriptures, you look at the, the Masoretic texts and, and others to sort of see how, how the text is shaped from various kinds of influences and what stands behind it. And this passage from Micah, which we could spend an entire session on, is very dense in many ways. Of course, at the heart of it, stands um, a peacemaker, a figure of peace who is God's chosen one, and the idea of security is very much associated with that figure, but there's a lot else in the text as well. Uh, there's the little clans, the little tribes, the, the big picture of the destiny of the people of Israel, the threatening nations around them, particularly Assyria, and the moving back between a vision of peace on the one hand and is there a need to make war on the other? Now, again, a lot can be, can be said about all of this, but I think you know, when we're looking at biblical texts, we need to look at um, the dynamism uh, of our reading of them in terms of our engagement and our witness. The Mennonite theologian uh, Millard Lynn did a book some years ago uh, which opens up some very interesting perspectives on all of this in terms of what we call the Old Testament, what others would call the Hebrew Scriptures. The book is called Yahweh is a Warrior. And it suggests actually a kind of that as there's a growing understanding and relationship as a people to God, then actually the desire or the need to make war uh, moves in a different kind of direction. So the people are gradually disarmed and reorientated in their understanding. And the, the whole range of... <laughs> Um, dilemmas that we face in terms of war and peace will be found in, in the text. But the question is, where is the moral core of those texts? I'm going to refer at the end of my talk to the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse, the last book in the Bible. Read one way, the book of Revelation could be seen as a kind of revenge fantasy, actually, of a group of people who feel marginalised and protected, and now it's payback time. But... At the moral heart of the text of the book of Revelation is the lamb who was slain. And it is the lamb who was slain who sits on the throne, who rules, rather than the slayers of lambs. Mm 
And unless you understand that, you're going to construe the text badly wrong in a whole range of ways. So we're talking about messy theology and shifting horizons, but there's a strong moral core to that as well in terms of thinking about security. And then lastly, immediacy and imagination. You know, as I say, we, we're all somewhere caught up between the local and the global in terms of our experience of what makes us secure or insecure. But what that translates into is that the pressures upon us may be very, very immediate. The threat may be, may be very, very immediate, and that will condition our response in a certain direction. But on the other hand, we're trying also, many of us, to look at the bigger picture of a different way, a different future. And so, in a sense, the issue of security is about how we negotiate the competition between those two kinds of, of pressures and impulses, if you like. Okay, this is... Um, oh, hang on. We seem to have gone there. Um, this is... Uh, a very simple overview in a way, but um, in terms of my own reading of things, I'd suggest that there are probably five foundational dimensions of security as we negotiate it as human beings in the different streams of life of which we are part. And I think many of these go back to part of our condition, conditioning, which is, of course, evolutionary, the struggle for survival. And yet we are so much more than that. We have the capacity not only to understand that reflexively, but to act out with, uh, to use a Scottish word that I'm used to using these days, uh, outside the, uh, uh, the conditioning that we have, both from our upbringing and our culture and our background and our maybe nationality, maybe you know, all the other things that may shape us, and also the, the kind of survival instincts that we start with. But nevertheless, we come back to these things. One way of looking at, at security is that it's about the avoidance of shortage. It's an economic issue. It's about how we gather what we need to, together so that when there are times of, of shortage or difficulties, then we are secure economically in what we have to eat, um, in our, our shelter and other kinds of things. And I hardly need to say that all of these issues can be experienced radically differently from a position of comfort uh, as compared to a position of poverty and vulnerability. So avoidance of shortage, constraining of death. Um, we particularly live in a culture which is trying to find all kinds of ways of, uh, well, perhaps not dealing with the issue of, of, of death. Actually, um, on the kitchen table uh, back at home in Edinburgh, there's a book called How to Avoid Death, and it's actually a book about food and the, the, the good food that you should eat and the food that you should avoid. And you can go into It's about 500 pages long. I, I don't think I'm going to read it. Uh, someone else in my household got it. And you can see a whole list of ways in which you could die and how you can adjust your, your, your uh, diet in order not to die. Um, and there's something both good and something both troubling about that, uh, I think. But fear of death and, and, and the insecurity that the possibility of death brings upon us and the actuality of death is obviously a foundational dimension of how we experience security and insecurity. Management of contingency. Life is fragile, incredibly fragile. Um, and, uh, you know, there are occasions, uh, things happen that suddenly make us aware just how fragile life is. How do we manage the contingency of things around us? Often there's an instinct to value strength. Um, mostly in political terms, when you talk about security, the next thing you talk about is military strength. Um, you know, we've come through a whole era of the Cold War in which uh, security was invested in something called mutually assured destruction, um, which is a paradox if ever you had one. And uh, there is still a default setting that security is achieved by being more mighty, having more weapons, uh, having more capacity for destruction than others who may wreak that same thing on us. Now, I don't need to say to this particular audience that that's one of the senses of, of security that I think has a sort of natural basis, but which we need to challenge and rethink and turn around. And I'm going to suggest that um, understood in a, in a non-conformist way, to use the, 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 the word of the day, um, Christianity points us in some very different directions on all of these things. And then there's the seeking of protection from our neighbours, from our culture, from our society. Um, 
dare I say, you know, in the light of, of the, the vote for Brexit, the rise of Donald Trump in America, people uh, seeking protection and security in ways which might actually turn out to be very threatening in other senses. So our initial instincts are not necessarily the most reliable ones. Just a kind of aside about the paradoxical psychology of security, and there's a lot more that could be said about that, but security is both a, an intra as well as an interpersonal thing. Uh, it's about individu individuals as well as how we're embedded in society. But there is a sense in which when you're externally actually objectively looking at it fairly secure, then often you're more likely to worry about personal insecurity in a number of uh, different ways. Um, if you're you know, financially secure and secure in other kinds of ways, maybe the question, does my bum look big in this, becomes very important for you in terms of your <laughs> body image and, and sense of self and presence to others and so on. It can even come down to small things like that. But I suppose what I'm thinking about is the fear of terrorism at the moment. And, uh, you know, what's sweeping across the Western world is a whole way of looking at the world and of organising ourselves and of investing in homeland security, as it's called in the States, has other names in, in different parts of Europe to guard against terrorism. I'm not saying that there isn't a threat there, but of course, as I'm sure we're aware, just crossing the road, there is more danger that you're going to be killed than there is in one of these kind of events. So if we structure the whole of life to ward against, uh, against this one thing, then we're going to distort a whole lot of other things about the way that we live, and our personal sense of security is going to be distorted. On the other hand, when you're objectively rather externally insecure, ironically, you're often likely to want to nurture um, the sources of personal security in different kinds of ways. Now, um, there's a kind of mythic way of talking about the Blitz spirit, um, but, you know, that's the first thing people often say, you know, well, you know, when a city is under attack in that kind of way, the bombs are threatening, you don't know whether you're going to be alive the next day. The kind of immediacy of your relationships and what you have to do to survive becomes incredibly important to you. Um, I use the word myth in the modern rather than the theological sense. In the theological sense, it means a story which tells you a truth beyond what you can immediately grasp. In the modern way of using it, it means something that's not true. Um, I'm using it in that sense to describe this. There's a slight myth to that. I discovered, for example, fairly recently that uh, there were more uh, strikes uh, during the Second World War than there were immediately before or immediately afterwards. So, uh, you know, the idea that everyone was pulling together and, and so on is, is somewhat simplistic, but it has a truth attached to it as well. And another example you might make, make is that, for example, if you are a, um, a landless farmer in Bangladesh, what will be important to you in terms of security is your family because your family will be your livelihood. We often talk about the threat of population growth and so on, but from the point of view of many poor people, having more kids makes a huge amount of sense because you know, they are about your economic survival and your future. Whereas in other parts of the world, having fewer kids um, makes you better off economically and so on. So when we look at these issues of insecurity and security, the difference between poverty and wealth, uh, vulnerability and strength becomes very, very important. Okay, moving on to say a few things about Christianity as a recipe for insecurity in the sense of rejecting um, some of the false notions of security that seem very commonplace in our culture, and I chose this interesting graphic um, produced as I think you recognise by Banksy. Uh, there is the carrying of the cross and there are police there, there's the media there, there's a whole apparatus around it. What on earth does this symbol mean in that sense? If uh, you can remember back to the five foundational men uh, dimensions of security that I mentioned, uh, what I'm describing as the way in which Chris can, Christian faith can disarm a certain sense of security will be connected to that. So I talked about the common desire and struggle to avoid uh, shortage. Um, by contrast, what's at the heart of the Christian gospel is not hoarding, but sharing. 
and uh, that's true of the Jewish faith and uh, of, of um, Muslim traditions and other religious traditions as well. But if we go back into the Hebrew scriptures, remember the story of the manna in the desert. What is it? Um, it's there. It provides food. As soon as you try and, and, and grab hold of it and store it and hoard it, it disappears. Or it, the, the, the gospel story about the rich fool who builds huge barns and stores everything and then ends up dying and it's a waste of time. By contrast, at the heart of the gospel is the sharing of food. The vision of the kingdom of God, the realm of God, is of a feast that we will all participate in together. Jesus shares table fellowship with all kinds of undesirable people in order to create new relationships. It's in the sharing of, of food, particularly, that we begin to discover a new way of life. So, whereas there is a kind of natural desire to avoid shortage, to, to hoard, to grab for ourselves. The gospel encourages, encourages us to share, not to hoard. Likewise, rather than constraining death, there is a sense in which our faith is about embracing death, not in a pathological sense, but looking at facing the reality of it, which I'll come on to say a little bit more uh, about in a moment. And there's an accepting of contingency rather than a ceaseless struggle to manage it as if somehow the world is controllable because it's not controllable in the ways that our technocratic and technological society would often lead us to believe. And we discover that in, in intimate family and personal moments, that it's not controllable. So there's a sense of accepting contingency and along with that valuing vulnerability um, the task in order to, to follow Jesus and to unleash the spirit is actually binding the strong man rather than holding the strong man up as uh, the answer to all our problems, which perhaps is maybe something that's happening on the other side of the Atlantic at the moment. People are investing their hope in a strong man who just says, you know, I'm not going to go into detail, but just hand the power to me and I'll put everything right. This is a profoundly dangerous thing. And of course, um, Jesus on the cross is exactly the opposite of that. Um, there is a sense in which I think Nietzsche is right and wrong to accuse Christianity of holding up weakness as, as a virtue. But certainly the kind of strength um, embodied in the vulnerability of Jesus and of the prophets as we've been reading earlier today is very different to the kind of strength that exists by power, might and threat not by power, not by my might but by my spirit saith the Lord is one of, again, the ancient Hebrew texts and then rather than simply seeking protection for ourselves the offering of shelter is fundamental to the gospel as well going right to the end of Matthew, when did I see you homeless or without food or in prison and so on. So it's in discovering the needs of others that we begin to discover more truly about the needs of ourselves. So I would suggest that, that there's a whole exploration that we can go on here, but some of the sort of foundational dimensions of how we conventionally conceive security are undermined or perhaps pointed in a very different direction by... Uh, some of the strong non-conformist elements within Christianity. <coughs> security and the threat of insecurity is, of course, a political weapon. And um, when I was preparing for this, I was asked to do a small piece for a magazine. And I decided to, to focus on uh, the Christian experience of baptism as a way of dealing with a false sense of security premised on the power of death. Now, whenever I say this, I'm always conscious that I have Quaker friends and others in the room who won't necessarily uh, orientate the way, whoops, uh, the way they see things around um, sacraments and ritual and sacred occasions, but have their own way and their own language and their own tradition for doing similar kinds of things. So forgive me for speaking from my experience. But when we talk about um, the experience of baptism, the experience of baptism is actually, um, uh, it's about regime change. It's about moving from a culture and an understanding premised on death to a culture and understanding premised on the free offer of life. That's one thing it is. What happens to you physically uh, or ritually in some ways, that you're taken down into the waters of death and then you are raised up and released from that death. And I think a good way of looking at our baptism is to say it's a way of getting our dying in first. 
so that the thought of death does not control every action that we take. And so I'm suggesting that baptism is a direct counter uh, to the regime of death and to the threat of insecurity as a way of controlling us and controlling people. We can begin to look at a whole lot of things in our faith and traditions in those terms as well. And then lastly, getting to yes and no, personalising truth in a dissembling culture, I put, what's that got to do with security? Well, uh, a lot of security is based on getting people to believe uh, that uh, what they should trust in is something that actually, in the end, will destroy them. And so being clear about that, being clear about the regime change that I've talked about is extremely important. Um, in Matthew's Gospel it says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. And I was amused as I was telling someone this morning to hear on the BBC yesterday a very good little five minute snippet about um, Theresa May uh, going to Germany. Some of you may have heard it, so forgive me for, for repeating it. But um, the person who was commenting on this said, well, there's a, a sort of cultural and language issue here because for a lot of British people, no actually is a, a sort of polite way of saying yes. You know, So he talked about you know, a group of, of, of young women who were preparing to go to Germany and uh, you know, were told, well, you know, if the biscuits come round, uh, you know, your instinct may be to say, oh, no, 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 no. And then, of course, what you're hoping is that they'll be offered again. And then you say, oh, yes, thank you. That, that's very nice. So your, your no is actually a way of saying yes. But if you go to Germany and try, try and do that, it's not going to work. Because when you say no, that's what they think you mean. <laughs> and without going into too much detail of, of that, what was being said about, uh, about our Prime Minister going to meet the Chancellor in Germany is that, that there are many people in our culture at the moment who seem to think that when Mrs Merkel says to us, actually, you can't have um, a single market and no freedom of movement for, for people, no. What, what actually we think is, well, that's what they're saying, but if we push just a bit harder and do this and do that, it, it's going to change. So the difficulty is that, that we've kind of grown up and created through the spin culture of the last 20 or 30 years particularly, a kind of dissembling culture that finds it difficult to say actually what yes means and what no means. And this uh, doesn't make us secure, it makes us profoundly insecure at the, uh, at the end of the day. And all of us in this room have the capacity to counter that kind of culture by starting to get clear about some of the things that need to be said, no matter how uncomfortable they are. So these are some personal as well as some uh, broad theological reasons for thinking that Christianity can be a recipe for undermining a false sense of security. So in that sense, a recipe for, for what the world may regard sometimes as insecurity. <coughs> Finally, rediscovering morality beyond security. Morality was something I was asked to talk about and it was in the title. As I say, I'm not going to, to define it, but I want to just say the following things about morality and security. It seems to me that morality is probably primarily about finding ourselves in relation to the other, both the comfortable other who gives us a sense of security and the actually or potentially threatening other. As I'm sure everybody knows, there are kind of, you know, if you, if you begin to look at this uh, academically, there are, there are three kinds of ethics. Um, there's the utilitarian ethics that decides what be, might be the best thing to do for the majority of people or the, the, the best number of people in particular situations, related also to what's called situation ethics. There's uh, what's grandly called deontological ethics, which is a strong strand within the Hebrew scriptures and early Christianity as well, which is the setting of commandments and rules to provide the guidelines by which we may uh, live our lives and make ethical decisions and um, you know ad adjusting to the situation and following rules are very important but as St Paul reminds us uh, there is also a sense in which the, the, the law kills and it's the spirit that gives life and so there's another tradition which I think is very central to a whole strand of Christianity that we've tended to leave which is virtue ethics which is asking what does it mean to be a good person what, how do we nurture um, people who can practice peacemaking and forgiveness? 
and doing justice and living justly in an economic sense and exhibit courage and all kinds of, of things. There, there, there are virtue traditions, of course, uh, which go back to ancient Greek philosophy, but there's a, a biblical tradition of virtue as well. And then what kind of character do we need to be in order to practice those virtues? And that's not something we're going to be on our own, able to do on our own. So how do we become part of a community that begins to inculcate a different set of practices, a different orientation towards the world, has a different ideology of what security is really about, and puts that into practice. That's powerfully important, it seems to me. Uh, a couple of other things before I close. Beyond the security of the lie, the theologian Walter Wink, in his um, Powers trilogy and in various other parts of his writings, talks about uh, the lie, and the lie that he's particularly talking about is what he calls the myth of redemptive violence that the world is divided into goodies and baddies and that you need to get as many goodies having uh, physical power over the baddies as possible. You know, it's a bit like the, the discourse around um, gun control in the United States is that you know, what we need to make sure is that as many good people have got guns and that's going to stop the bad people. But actually, of course, what this reaps at the end of the day is destruction rather than security. There's a whole myth of redemptive violence. That's just one aspect of what Walter Wink uh, calls in capital letters the lie and it's about how we resist the lie and this is often profoundly difficult and one of the lessons that I think we need to learn is the lesson of Bonhoeffer and how to live truthfully in a world that's often stacked with lies. Um, his writings on ethics are of course somewhat fragmentary and were put together at the end of his life after he was killed at um, Flossenburg concentration camp but one of the things uh, that's often quoted at Bonhoeffer is his uh, rather shocking statement that um, a lie uh, on the lips of a truthful person is worth far more than a truth on the lips of a liar. And in the 1960s, this was misunderstood as uh, situation ethics, deciding what's best. And it's, it's actually completely the opposite of that. Let me explain it in the following terms. Uh, Bonhoeffer, um, as part of... of much of his life before he was arrested and eventually killed was uh, a member of the Abwehr, military intelligence in Nazi Germany. And of course he was trying to achieve a lot of other things while he was doing this office job for the Abwehr, but he would discover on a regular basis that he would be having coffee with people, talking to people and so on. And they were part of a Nazi war machine, but they would tell the truth all the time about all kinds of mundane things. And it didn't really mean anything because they were caught up in a lie. On the other hand, imagine a situation, and it could be in Nazi Germany, it could be in lots of places in the world, where uh, an oppressive regime asks you if you are hiding a group of vulnerable people who they want to get out and possibly kill. And actually, you are um, hiding them, but what you say is, no, I'm not. You tell a lie. But actually, far more fundamentally important <coughs> Than telling that lie is that what you are doing through that lie is protecting the life of a person and you are living in the light of the truth that the gospel calls us to even in the most compromised and difficult of circumstances so I'm not pretending that any of this stuff is easy um, I'm not saying go out there and lie either what I'm saying is we need to judge things in terms of whether we are part of the regime of death or part of the regime of life and that's going to be determined by things which are much larger uh, than some of the mundanities that we get caught in. So Bonhoeffer is, is asking the question, what does it mean to be truthful people in the context of a culture of lies? And then the last example I want to use, associating our lives with the Lamb. I started off at the beginning by referring to the moral and theological core of the book of Revelation as the one on the throne being the Lamb who was slain rather than slayers of lambs. But to, the fo to follow the Lamb is to follow a crucified one. And uh, it's to put ourselves in the most vulnerable and insecure position that is possibly imaginable. Many of you will know of and work with and collaborate with Christian peacemaker teams. There's a little bit of the history of the founding of that, which I think is, is, is um, usefully troubling and also not spoken about much. And that was the speech that the Mennonite theologian Ronald Sider gave back in 1984 when he and others were conceiving the idea of Christian peacemaker teams. 
What he actually said was that if there are going to be teams of peacemakers going into situations of often intractable violence and oppression, um, you know, they are going to be seeking to create a pathway to peace that doesn't exist, to witness to the Prince of Peace, to witness to a different way beyond uh, violence. But that means in many situations they're going to be vulnerable and they're going to end up getting killed. And what he said was, maybe in order for this vision of, of, of peacemaking teams to work, thousands upon thousands of us need to be killed. Mm. Now, hold that idea in relation to the recent history of suicide bombing and so on. Mm. One of the things that shocks us most in the West is that there are people in the world who are not controlled by death. Sadly, uh, whilst that's true at a personal level, nevertheless, when you, when, you, when you give your life to kill others, you are actually contributing to a culture of death uh, and so on. And that's why there's such a strong critique of, of those kind of activities within Muslim communities as well, and that's very important. But it's just worth noting that Sider wasn't saying anything remarkably different, but he was talking about giving our lives for the way of peace rather than for a culture of death. But the reason I sort of say that is that you know, it's very easy for me to stand up and say these fine things about security and insecurity, but really, um, am I willing, if necessary, to respond to that kind of call which does lie at the heart of the gospel? The gospel is not uh, a, an easy thing. It's something that you know, I as a Christian want to avoid in many circumstances. Mm. And so really what that's all about, and it's my last point here, is that for us as Christians, the global challenge is something, it seems to me, about how God's intimate otherness is the guarantee of our final security. Um, the, the Christian way of revenge is called resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus is not, as Bishop David Jenkins once got into trouble for saying, but he was entirely right about that, is not some kind of arcane conjuring trick with bones that proves that God is a magician. The resurrection is actually God's verdict that the one who is unjustly killed, Jesus, is vindicated and that the order of death that his crucifixion at the hands of the state and of religious authorities as well is not the final word but that only God at the end of the day can give life in that sense. We can nurture life and share life and create life through birth and other kinds of things, but at the end of the day, the kind of radical giving of life uh, that turns on its head and ends the power of death is something that only God can do. And so if we are people of faith, that's ultimately where we are putting or where we're supposed to be putting our trust, our sense of security. And the important thing about that is that um, God is not an object in the world to be compared with other objects. God um, does not compete for space with us. God doesn't compete with us in any, any kind of way at all. Um, as human beings, no matter how virtuously we try to live and construct our relationships, there's always a sense in which we are in tension, in competition, in which our attempts to love will be compromised. But precisely because God is not one of us in that sense, it's, it's idolatry to think of that. Um, God's love is of the overflowing kind which we cannot control, but is simply sheer gratuity. And that is where ultimately the sense of security that has a theological orientation is going to come from. And it has profound effect, it seems to me, on the kind of choices that we face in life and how we handle issues of security and insecurity. Thank you. I'll just put up this one final slide. Uh, there wasn't enough enough uh, it's it, it just something that came across my desk recently and I just thought uh, from Yanis Varoufakis the former Greek finance minister and very interesting economist saying one million refugees came to Greece and never left the result is we are a stronger and better country okay. talk about turning um, a, 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 a narrative of security and insecurity <coughs> in its head and it just reminded me of this other thing that also came across my desk which is resistance is fertile and fertility of course is about how we breed life, how we act life how we plant mm -hmm. seeds, how we do something very different in an often unfertile culture <laughs>
Thank you very much, Simon, for getting us deeply into this question.